All right, so today I'm going to be making potassium nitrate, which is a really useful chemical in a lot of reactions, and it's a fantastic oxidizing agent. To be making this, I'm going to follow this reaction right here using the ammonium nitrate that I made in a previous video and a surplus of potassium chloride that I have. This reaction looks to be favorable because, as you can see, it goes over and favors the products of ammonium chloride and potassium nitrate, but I wanted to show why this is favorable, so I will be explaining a little bit of thermodynamics in this video. Alright, so now I'm going to determine if this reaction is thermodynamically favorable, and if you, want to hear, if you don't want to hear this discussion, there will be a time that I'll put up here, and you can skip to then. Basically, thermodynamics is based off of this equation right here, which is the Gibbs free energy, and it's determined from the enthalpy of a reaction, the entropy of a reaction, and a specific temperature. The temperature is measured in um, degrees absolute, uh, which is on the Kelvin scale, meaning that zero is the absolute um, lowest possible temperature anywhere in the universe. And so anyways, let's talk a little bit about delta G. If delta G has a negative value, the reaction will be spontaneous or have um, thermodynamic favorability, meaning that it'll occur on its own. So Basically, we can look at this as, uh, say that there's a log burning in a fireplace that is going to um, happen on its own. Once a log is on fire, it's basically going to burn until there's nothing left and all the fuel's used up. All the while, there's going to be energy leaving the system as heat, and so relative to the log, the energy is um, leaving, and so it's negative and going away but the reaction is happening on its own, so it's spontaneous. If the value is positive, energy would have to be coming into the system for the reaction to happen, so it's not thermodynamically um, favorable, and it's not spontaneous per se. And if the value is zero, the reaction would be in equilibrium, and so there will be a defined you know, amount of each of these molecules present, and that will be consistent until the equilibrium is shifted. That really isn't relative to this um, reaction, and the positive um, value for delta G could become relevant if this temperature was much more extreme, because you can see that the value right here um, would far outweigh the delta H eventually. So now that we have that finished with, we can look at the enthalpy or the delta H or the heat of formation um, for each of these reactants and products of the overall equation. So enthalpy is defined as the amount of energy that's liberated as a mole of this molecule is produced from its constituent atoms, meaning hydrogen, helium, uh, <laughs> hydrogen, the, um, nitrogen, and oxygen, if all those are combined in this exact ratio. Um, 365.6 kilojoules of energy will be released per mole, and you can see that um, all these values are negative. Energy is being released for the formation of all of these molecules from their respective elements. And we can also look at the entropy, which is the amount of disorder that's achieved from forming these molecules. So basically, if you look, this has nitrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen. This has chlorine, and so on. They all have gases. Co um, combined in them. And if you were to form them from their elements, you would have gases, which are extremely disorderly, um, floating around chaotically, hitting each other sporadically, all coming together to form well-defined crystalline solids. And so there's a great increase of order that's associated with the formation of these molecules. And so the delta S's for these are all positive. And so to look at the overall delta S and delta H for the reaction, we have to follow this equation right here, um, which basically the summation of the delta S's of the products minus the summation of the delta S's of the reactants is equivalent to the overall delta S of the reaction. And so you can see we get these values right here, and I've converted them all into the same terms of kilojoules, so which makes them comparable and usable in the overall Gibbs free energy equation. Right here, you can see I just expanded it with all the terms. Um, it's not really that useful. Um, anyways, and so once all of the terms are combined with the temperature, which was measured in my house, um, 
you see that the delta G is negative and this reaction is spontaneous and will occur um, at this given temperature. All right, so now that we know Wikipedia hasn't lied to us and the reaction is favorable at room temperature, um, we can go about actually making some of the potassium nitrate. And so if I want to produce 500 grams of potassium nitrate, you can see I've done some simple stoichiometry um, to determine the amount of the reactants that I will need, and I have determined these values. So now we can go weigh out um, how much we need. You'll see that as I was weighing out the ammonium nitrate and potassium chloride, I had to do a lot of small individual weighings. Uh, this is because the max weight on my scale is about 200 grams. I didn't want to overload it. This ended up taking quite a while. Once everything was weighed out, I added all of the salts to about 2 liters of water and I tossed in a stir bar. The stir bar was turned on and it helped mix everything together and make sure everything got dissolved. You'll notice that the solution appears quite opaque and initially I thought that this was due to undissolved salts and so I started a light heating. Very quickly, however, I figured out that this was a particle suspension and so I needed to remove some of these insoluble impurities. So I started a vacuum filtration process and in the end I was only able to collect about a gram or so of insoluble material in the filter. I'm pretty sure that this contaminant is from the ammonium nitrate that I used because it was initially a fertilizer and there's still probably some trace amounts even though I recrystallized it. After the filtering you can see that the solution was nearly crystal clear and it was a lot better than what we started with. Now to isolate the potassium nitrate we'll have to place the solution outside where it's below freezing. We can play on the solubility of the products from the reaction and it's pretty easy to see that potassium nitrate is much less soluble than ammonium chloride at this temperature. So the potassium nitrate will end up crystallizing out of solution as it's supersaturated and the ammonium chloride will stay dissolved. I ended up leaving the crystals outside for about two days but after the first day it appeared that most of them had formed and so I decided to do a vacuum filtration. This will help suck off any of the remaining solution and it also help dry the crystals out. At this point, it's pretty easy to see that we don't have 500 grams of potassium nitrate and that means that there's a lot more still dissolved in the solution. Once the crystals were dry, I placed them in a separate container and turned my attention back to the main solution. So theoretically, through the process which we made this potassium nitrate, we also produced 264 grams of ammonium chloride. This should all remain dissolved in about a liter of water at zero degrees Celsius. And since I added two liters initially, we can reduce the volume by one liter. Once this is completed, we can then take the solution and place it inside the freezer. The second crystallization produced substantially less crystals, but nevertheless, it'll help improve the yield in the end. I then did the same process that I did for the first batch of crystals and I ran them through a vacuum filtration and this helped dry them and then I added all of the crystals together into a main stock. Despite the fact that all of these crystals were produced through um, selective crystallization, they're still going to have some trace contaminants on them. To help remove these impurities, we're going to have to do one final crystallization. So I took all of the crystals that we had produced thus far and added them into the large beaker with about 300 milliliters of water. Now obviously all of these crystals aren't going to dissolve at this temperature so we'll have to bring the solution to nearly boiling. You can see here that everything dissolved pretty nicely. The solution was then placed back in the freezer where everything crystallized out for one last time. This final crystallization will decrease the yield in the end, but it'll also improve the purity of our product, so it's definitely worth it. The solution that we're filtering off should contain all traces of the ammonium chloride, the potassium chloride, and any unreacted ammonium nitrate. Even after drying for a long time on the vacuum filter, the crystals are still wet, so I place them in the oven for a while at 300 degrees Fahrenheit. During this process, some of the water that had remained on the crystals caused them to redissolve and agglomerate together into a hard mass. So before transferring them to the storage container, I decided to mortar and pastel them into a fine powder.
The jar that you see here was pre-massed at 288 grams. So after all the crystals were pulverized and transferred into it, I then weighed the tr jar again and I was able to determine that I had produced 297.4 grams of potassium nitrate. I was then able to determine that my percent yield was around 59%, which is quite low. I attribute this to the highest solubility of the potassium nitrate and all of the successive crystallizations that I did. When I boiled the solution down, I intended to boil it down a full liter, but I ended up only doing 500 milliliters, and this also contributed. In the end, though, we were able to produce a pretty substantial amount of potassium nitrate.